Hey, what's up, everybody? Video 44 coming at you with another video. All right. It's about an hour away from game time. A little, yeah, about an hour. And uh, Lakers will be playing the Memphis Grizzlies, of course, in Memphis at FedEx Center. We've already done a pregame video, but <clears throat> just want to give you just how I'm feeling before the game. Um, how am I feeling before the game? Well, I feel really good. I'm, I've listened to a lot of pundits, people talking about the game, and of course, in it, at the end of the day, the, you know, everybody's telling the Lakers to essentially just be poised for a trap game. It's essentially what, what the vibes is because they're going to be having different rotations on out there. We don't quite know what we're going to be looking at, but we do know that this team has had some foot um, time without John Moran. That's what we need to understand. What they're going to be running out here is not supremely unprecedented. Why? Because they've been without Brandon Clark for about a month and a half. They've been without Steven Adams for about a month and a half. And they went without John Morant about a month ago for about two weeks. So whatever it is that they're running today, they've had some time with it. And we need to know that. We need to know that. Now, I don't know how much that's going to help them against a healthy Laker team, but that's not the point. The point is, how well do you think they're going to play with what it is that they're dealing with? And the question uh, can be answered with some data of teams, of them playing against teams with that Look, and so that's where I think I've messed up as a person who didn't watch highlights of games where that was the case. That's where I want my Lakers to have been much more prepared than I find myself being right now. Because we got about an hour left, and now I'm realizing there's some homework I could have done, and that is where it needs to be done or should have been done. Be those games that they didn't have job, those games need to be studied. And so that's, that's just a nugget I can bring to you guys. Um, I think the, 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 the at the end of the day, we don't really know if this game is any different than game one as it pertains to being a feel-out game. Because the reality is, first of all, we don't know if Josh's playing or not, so that leaves everything up in the air. But if they're not going to have Ja out there, then we're feeling out that new team. <laughs> That's essentially what I'm telling you. It's like, yeah, the first game one was a feel-out game, but if you're going to be running somebody else out there in game two, then guess what else we got to do? We got to feel out that version of yourself as well. So this is like feel-out game two. <laughs> Essentially how I'm feeling about this game. Feel-out game two. We're going to start realizing who they're going to be if they can't have John. Now, here's the thing about that. John's not going to be out for long. Just like I told y'all when he initially hurt the, ink, the, the hand, I didn't think he was going to be missing much time just because he's a superhuman and there was no structural damage. So then it becomes a how much pain are you in? How quickly can you heal thing? You weigh that against him being a superhuman who can jump over people like Michael Jordan. And then you look at it and say, OK, that's the hand. That's the hand that can dunk on the rim harder than anyone else, <laughs> you know, to his size, that kind of thing. So it's like one could theorize that it's likely he would be able to heal from any ligament damage or anything like that 10 times faster than someone like myself who don't have those genetics and, and much older than him he's flexible you know what i'm saying so the way that he hurt himself he dodged injury and now it's just about whether or not <clears throat> his genetics are going to work in his favor and his genetics have definitely worked in his favor to, to this point so that's kind of how i look at stuff like that i'm not a doctor so i gotta kind of you know which doctor to the thing like does this make sense kind of to my brain yeah i think that's how i'm looking at this basically john moran um is is an elastic youngster who should be able to heal from anything that doesn't quote, require structural damage rather quickly especially if he's inspired for which he is i don't know how determined this child is and i say child with respect he's a grown man but how determined is this young man that's my question how determined is he now, these are the type of things where champions will find a way to bull through all of this and get the most out of what it is their, their team can give them. Now, whether they win or not, if they have too little to win, probably not win. But if he goes off, plays, and goes for 40, then we understand what we're actually dealing with. Because we really don't know. John Morant is a, is a player who's only been in the league for a couple years. And while he's wowed a lot of people with stats and good play, and there's not a whole lot he cannot do when he's focused on the offensive end, my question is, is when the chips are down when he's had too much when he's down as down as he looked at the end of that game with his hand wrapped up talking about you know everything's just going wrong and it just one more thing this is when we find out what he's really worth in terms of do he have the heart to pull himself out of that do he have the heart to pull himself out of that that's what i'm saying to his opponent 
You know what I mean? As his opponent, I'm poised to see if this is a special young man or just a really talented young man. You know what I mean? That's where I'm at with it. He came into the, uni- the arena today. He didn't have his jewelry on. I think some think that's a sign he's not. He is playing. I don't know nothing about that. But that's what the Grizzly fan was saying in the comment section. He ain't coming with his jewelry. He's playing. I don't have any context. Maybe that's that's a sign or something. I don't know. Maybe they know their player. But what I'm saying is that's something I'm telling us. Be ready for not only John Morant to play, but for him to try to show us some unprecedented level of heart that we haven't seen from him. And if that is the case, we'd better match it. We'd better match it. You know, because this could be one of them rest in peace Willis Reed moments where dude come back and give his team just enough to have them playing outside of themselves. And if all of them play outside of themselves, rallying around him, sort of like I say, this king's rallying around the beam. If that is what ends up happening, we can get punched in the mouth. We can get punched in the mouth. Luke Kennard can go for 30, 30 points. Bain can go for 30 points. And then Jaron Jackson goes for 30 points. And that's 90 points right there. I ain't including anything else we're getting out of anybody else. So I'm not saying that I'm expecting that, but I'm saying if the, if the Memphis Grizzlies are going to win, that's the type of performance they need. They need about three people or four people to, to accumulate 90 points. And they have the personnel to do it, <clears throat> especially if we come out flat, play with a fast pace, and turn the ball over. And see, that's another thing. Pace is important in a game like this. Pace is important in this series, and pace is going to be important in the next series. Either way, if we're lucky enough to get out of this one. Because we're playing against teams in this situation where they're young, who are likely going to want to pay at a fast pace, who are likely going to convert on a lot of possessions. So what we need to do is make sure that the pace we're playing at is a pace that fits us. Because if you get into a pace conversation with this team, you could have some trouble, especially if Jaws out there. And if we talk about Sacramento Kings, they're the pace kings. <laughs> we should. The paces are in Indiana, but the real pacers are actually in Sacramento. So we need to understand that rest is obviously the most important thing for us since it looks like that next series could be short too if Sacramento run out run out of there and get two games in Golden State. So we don't want them to be more fresh than us since they're already more fresh than everybody else as we discussed earlier today. So while it's not smart to look past Sacramento, Memphis, it is important to <clears throat> understand what you're up against. As a fullness of your roster, not roster, but the fullness of your uh, outlook is starting to become a little more possible, a little more clear. You know, it looks like if we get out of here, it looks like we could be seeing sack. And so it's time to start thinking about how best to not over do anything in this series. Get out the requisite amount of energy necessary to defeat these this Memphis Grizzly team and then save everything else. That's why I want us to come out, punch them in the mouth, come out. If we find ourselves getting punched in the mouth, erase that deficit, you know what I mean? Rather quickly if we can. I look at us as a team that... We did the impossible already. And much has been said about that already. Trevor Lane gave us a rundown of how the Lakers have overcome a 10-2 deficit. I thought it was 10-3. He said it was 10-2. I trust his, his memory. But the point was we were we had a record of 10, a 2 and 10, and turned that thing around and find ourselves in the playoffs favored to win the first round. <laughs> it's an unprecedented turnaround. You got to congratulate the Los Angeles Lakers organization and Rob Palenka and the players, the coaching staff, and everybody had anything to do with this, scouts, everybody for putting us in this position. Uh, as a fan, I'm very happy. Uh, that gives me the confidence that we can erase other types of deficits. Now, maybe that's misguided. A lot of things had to fall into place. A lot of stuff that happened in that regard is not related to anything that's going on in the court, but I still think it's a motivating factor when you consider how far fast we turned our thing around. We should not find ourselves in a situation where we're down by 17 tonight and feel like we out of it. Hell no, especially with them having players missing. This is a situation where just by what you're looking at on paper, you should be able to throw units at them that they can't throw at you, which should thus erase any deficit you got. Not the full deficit in on paper, but what I'm saying is in my mind's eye, it's just going to be some advantages out there naturally. You know, you got to be trying very hard not to have certain schematic advantages in this game if you're the Los Angeles Lakers. Even if Ja is out there, they're down some people. That should make it so that they're a bit smaller than they need to be to beat us. And so that's what I'm saying to you. We just got to play smart. Just like I said earlier, no cowboy passes, no cowboy nonsense, no bad shooting. If we come out lethargic, we got to replenish with fresher players. Don't lean on the cold head. And all the little stuff that is just, at this point, uh, 
obvious because we've had so many looks at this having played a whole season. We've made a lot of mistakes. We've made a lot of corrections. We've fixed a lot of mistakes, and we've solidified certain tendencies. Uh, so we got to just use the data that we've always had about ourselves and apply it to what we're doing going forward. I like how our team looks, though. I like that, that we've got uh, time, rest, has been applied to this team over the last 11 and 12 days when you consider we've only played about three basketball games in that span time span of time i'm encouraged that our team is much more fresh this week than we were maybe last month so to speak you know what i mean based on how much basketball has been played and then how much rest we've gotten after that so this has been one of the most important rest weeks of our season uh this little stretch here in memphis um i think because at the end of the day you end the season on like a week's rest you play one single game and then you rest for like three days in Memphis. We played this game and then we rest uh, till Saturday. So I just think that that is so very important for what we are doing. It's important for the path we're on. If, if we have to see sack next, all of that is important. So we need to continue to just buy ourselves that rest by playing as absolutely good as possible. Um, making every possession count, playing loose, playing smart, playing free. All of these different things that allow us to be our best. And I like the fact that this game is in Memphis because we've already gotten through the worst of it. Even if we lose tonight's game, <clears throat> home court advantage is ours. And that is a big deal. What does home court advantage mean to me? It means as long as you have it, you're not forced to win on the other team's building anymore. At this point, we can win this series by winning all of our home games now. We, we don't have to win another game in Memphis. Now, obviously, you need to win every game you're in but what i'm saying is mathematically you're not forced to ever win a game on that powder blue floor for the rest of the season and that is a very big deal because when i look at the golden state warriors their situation is they must in order to get out of this series they must win a game in sacramento and given the fact that they've had trouble winning on, on the road all year i practically think that series is over based on that tendency alone and so we look at this and say Let's take advantage of what we have here. Home court advantage was not ours when we started this series. We took it from them. If we keep this game, if we get this one, we really have stranglehold on that advantage. <laughs> and while I'm already in a space where I'm ready to tell you I don't believe the Memphis Grizzlies can win four out of six games against the Lakers, I can certainly tell you I don't think they can win four out of five. I can certainly tell you that. So this is a must win. This is a must win for the Los Angeles Lakers, and it's a very must win for the Memphis Grizzlies and trying to match their intensity is going to be a challenge because they're fighting for their lives. <laughs> it's the end of the day, they're fighting for their lives. So uh, no lackadaisical nonsense. And, and I think we will be able to match what they're bringing us. So long as we stay focused and more hungry and more desperate than them, more desperate than them. Why are we more desperate than them? Cause we can actually win it. We can actually win it. <laughs> they see themselves sealing out. They run, if they happen to get past us, I think the odds of them getting past Sacramento are very slim. If I like us matched up against Sacramento much better than I like Memphis, as currently constructed, matched up against Sacramento. Now, if Golden State won their series, Memphis comes out of this series somehow, I'm not so sure if Golden State, having come off beating Sacramento, is going to run into a lesser Memphis team and then have trouble with them. No, if they beat Sacramento, Golden State's beating Memphis too. And so this is a situation where I'm like, <clears throat> Memphis ain't got no chance, in my humble opinion. If we don't knock them off, somebody else will. We actually do have a chance. We got the roster to do it. We're healthy right now. Knock on wood to stay that way. We just got to keep on going forward. So that's really where I'm at with it, man. Our opportunity is real. Their opportunity looks bleak. And we just need to <clears throat> capture our moment and not give them anything. <laughs> Don't give them no hope they don't need. Don't give them no opportunities they don't need. No bulletin board material that they don't deserve. None of that. They're not a team we can poo-poo. They've been at the top of the Western Conference nearly the all year long, just like SAC, just like Denver. And uh, we know they know how to win games, even if they're undermanned. They're going to do things that help themselves as a team, and they're going to score the ball a lot. I do expect for them to go for over 110 points tonight without Ja. I do expect that. I'm telling you. I think Luke Kennard... He's going to have a big night by default. He's going to be shooting the ball a lot. Desmond Bain is going to want to respond to his state, his own statement or back up his own statement in regards to where we got tomorrow. So I expect for him to be spirited tonight. I do expect that. Dylan Brooks is going to do whatever Dylan Brooks does. 
We'll see. <laughs> That's how I look at Dylan Brooks. I just, I always look at him and I say, I think his immaturity is what really gets in his own way. And we've talked about that a lot. He's a heck of a player, but his, his bad outweighs the good in my eyes. I don't want to go as far as to say he's with us, but if he's who he normally is, he's with us. <laughs> I'm just being real, man. I'm being real. I look at him as the Achilles heel of the Memphis Grizzlies because he tries to be so a part of everything, takes on the brunt of everything, and then proceeds to do stuff not as good as the guys who should actually be doing it. You know, it's like, oh, if Desmond Bain was as aggressive as, as Dylan Brooks, that team would be that much better. If if Kennard was aggressive as Dylan Brooks, that team would be that much better. So that's kind of how I looked at that. You just got the wrong guy with the right spirit. Because he don't shoot well enough for all that energy you be having. But it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. I just don't know that, that that young man can back up all this talk that he talks. It's one thing to be able to have that kind of energy. It's another thing to not have the game to back it up. And that's a tough thing. So I'm just curious to see if he's going to start developing the game to back it up. Am I going to start seeing things from Dylan Brooks that shut me up? I'm waiting. Just like I said about John Moran, what type of heart do you got? What type of heart is in those kids? Yeah, I know they're acting folly and all that. They're doing stuff they shouldn't do. That's, that's silliness, right? But I don't think that's a reflection of you not having heart. I just think that's a reflection of you being young and not necessarily uh, seasoned enough to understand where you should be act, how you should be acting behavior-wise. It ain't got nothing to do with when you're staring up against a monster can you swing or are you going to soil yourself? Which is it? You know what I mean? And that's what I'm looking to see. I don't know. I don't even think the Grizzlies know what they have pumping in their chest just yet. They got a lot of confidence, but I don't even think they have any self-awareness as a team. I look at their team and I look at Tyus Jones. I look at Tyus Jones because Tyus Jones is probably the most mature person I can think of in that roster. Besides Steven Adams, who ain't going to be available. But it's Ty Jones. He's the one that doesn't embody all that. Rah, rah, rah. Him and Luke Kennard, to me, are the two people on that team that are outside of the energy of that team. They're going to contribute to it, but they ain't giddy and gritty and all that stuff. They're not doing all that. They're the ones that's kind of sitting in the background who would blend into any locker room, anywhere, and contribute the same way they do right here. And so those are the guys who, if they have a big night tonight, will carry their team, which is why we need to be very aware of what they do. And so I'm just poised to see Luke Kennard go off. I, I just know he's better than what he showed us in game one. And if they're going to have any type of offensive punch, it's going to be because he went for 28, 30, 32 points. Um, more than capable. From behind the arc. Uh, so supreme defense again. Everything. And we talk about Isaiah Williams. But if, if they're going to, if the Memphis Grizzlies are going to shock the world, it's going to be because players like Zaire Williams tapped into their highest potential and shocked the world by playing very, very well in key games. So Zaire Williams, uh, Santi Zaldama, I don't think I've said his name correctly once. Santi Zaldama, he, he needs to have a big uh, series for the rest of the way. Lofton, Conchar, all of those guys. I don't know if, if Taylor Jenkins is going to give them a lot of minutes or not, but I think if they are able to play their best, that is where we have our trouble. Because everything else is just, can they get something out of those other guys that they're going to be going to when they got to get away from Bain, Jackson, Brooks, Ja, if he's there. When they get away from them dudes, can they win their matchup against the Ruiz, against Troy, against Beasley? Can they win those matchups? That's going to be the question for the Memphis Grizzlies. If they can win those matchups on their home court, we're going to have our, our hands full. We're going to have our hands full, but... You know, just like anything else, man, I'm going to tell you guys, when you're under man, we can overthink and underthink this thing. But just like I said in the, in the video uh, leading up to this, one, Memphis Grizzlies really are depleted in a very serious way. We're going to have to play rather lazy and frivolous in order to effectively get beaten in this game. You got to come out flat and you got to stay flat. They got to come out, punch you in the mouth, and it has to be so bad that even though you have advantages, you can't overcome it. That's how much they're up against. I don't think that without all of their pieces, uh, that I don't think if they had all their pieces, that would be the case. I don't think that. If they were fully healthy, this is a much different series in my eyes. Uh, I don't even know if I picked the Lakers to win this series if Memphis is fully healthy. To be honest, I don't know that with them having home court advantage, but they're far from healthy. Jaws' hand is still going to be sore no matter how much it's healed over the last three days. That's still going to be a bit 
sore, if not extremely painful. And, uh, you know, it's playoff time, baby. And you've heard me talk like this a lot, but when you have a certain type of injury that I know is there, and I'm talking like if I was a basketball player for real, if I know it's there and that's your shooting hand, every time I run into you, I'm running into it. That's another reason why Josh probably should skip this game because if that hand has any chance of healing, it can't keep getting banged. It can't keep getting hit. Guys can't keep swiping at it. And that's exactly what I want our guys to do. Swipe at that hand. Yo, if he's bold enough to step out there and play basketball with a jacked up hand, this is playoff time, baby. Swing at him. Every time, swipe at him unnecessarily even. Make sure that hand is feeling extra pain all night long. Why? Because that's their best player. And he wants to play on an injury in the playoffs. And all of his predecessors, whoever came before him, dealt with this. And they dealt with this. You're injured? You want to play through it? You're going to feel us. You're going to feel us. Schroeder swiping at you. <laughs> Braun running into you. It's, it, it's just part of the game. And this is why it's important that the Grizzlies understand. Because they're kind of new to this playoff thing. This isn't harmless. If you send him out there, his shooting hand is going to get swiped at. His shooting hand is going to get bumped into. His shooting hand is going to find itself in some situations that's not all that positive. And so it's for, the, for what it is that I think I believe here, with him having three more days between this one and the next game Saturday, if I was on the Memphis side, I'd probably just punt this game too. Don't play him. Play him on Saturday and give him three, um, three more nights of sleep on that that hand. The healing will be much more likely to be in a better space to go. Even if he feels good enough today to kind of go, if somebody swipes at it the wrong way or if he has to fall and break his fall with his hand again, it's going to be another missed couple of days, maybe even worse. <laughs> I'm not a doctor, so I can't tell you if him getting hurt can, can get worse if for some reason he has some type of similar motion can the ligaments now snap did the bones get weaker i don't have any idea i'm not that kind of doctor but what i'm telling you is pain is pain and if you're trying to manage pain last thing you need is somebody swiping at you hitting you bumping you or anything of that nature he don't want none of that so it's a shooting hand and that makes it much more serious <clears throat> so i'm inclined to believe that the memphis grizzlies are going to actually sit john moran tonight that's what I've come to terms with is I've broken this down in my head. It just is too much of a risk. It's game two. It's not game four. It's not game five. None of that. It's still early in the series. They're nowhere near mathematically out. They don't have their back against the wall yet. They can afford to let Ja heal till Saturday and then take their chances in Los Angeles with a more so healthy Ja and still two tries to keep themselves alive. Um. That seems like a better strategy to me than send him out there, risk it getting re-injured, and then missing him for the rest of the season or the playoffs, which would be your season because if we win this game and he can't play the next one, he's out of here. So that's kind of that's just kind of how that's gonna go. Um, but if we if we beat them anyway, all, and, and Jaw walks out of here having had that hand beat up a little more, it's gonna be an empty effort for their team. And this is empty. It wasn't no no need to even bring him out there. So. That might be a thing. Maybe they limited his minutes to balance that out some tonight. I think that makes a lot of sense if he does go. But I think it even makes even more sense if he just doesn't go <laughs> and just lets that thing heal a little more until Saturday. Uh, so that's what I would want if I were a Memphis fan. Just punt this game, yo. Yeah, it puts us in an 0-2 hole, but you don't want any setbacks. That'll, that'll send you home. So that's, that's my suggestion to the Memphis Grizzlies. If I was not a Laker fan and I was strategizing a way to try to extend this thing you after all we've talked about here that's that's the conclusion i've come to so uh yeah man as far as everything else uh lebron james is coasting i love the idea that he's in a role that allows him to play off the ball i love the idea he's in a role that's not allowing him to over put pressure on the rim with his foot being hurt even though i literally challenge him to do that all the time i think the bigger picture is you want to keep him healthy and if he's constantly doing these function to do that foot that foot it's probably going to be a equalizer for us if he goes back down with that damn thing. And we don't need no damn equalizers at all. So um, I want us to, to, to use Braun wisely, but I don't want him to really go up over 36 minutes tonight. I really don't. 
Uh, I would, especially if Jaws is going to be out, I think we could sneak rest for our stars. <laughs> that's that's the beauty of being uh, as deep as we are and as talented as we are as a team. You don't really have to have Braun doing really much of nothing, really, uh, until he's 100% healthy. He don't have to do too much. Uh, but I'm sure he will involve himself a great deal because it's playoff time. Um, and that's a good thing. So defensively is where I want his energy. Just like in the last game, I think that's a recipe for success for us. Um, you know, being mindful of turnovers and just how not to give himself passes to continue to turn the ball over the way he has his entire career. Because I think we're really legitimately in a space where if he shores that up, we're basically unbeatable. If you look at our stats every night, the one thing that you can count on on the negative side of things is his turnovers. And he usually has about five, six, seven of them regularly. And it's been like that his entire career, pretty much. He's a regular turnover guy. But what I'm saying is, it's the time. It's time. Now is the time to be extra intent on not allowing anything to slip through the cracks in that way, if possible. Some things you just can't change. But if there's a difference between getting seven turnovers and four turnovers for the king, it's ever so important that he be ever so careful with that throughout these playoffs if he wants to get his fifth ring. If he wants to get his fifth ring. And it's not because his turnovers are the worst thing in the world in the NBA. It's because his turnovers are the worst thing in the world for this roster. So that's what I'm trying to get him to understand. These tendencies are real. You know, just like we're a bad three-point shooting team to start the season. So if we jack up 10 threes, it's bad for us as a team. If he turns the ball over seven times like he's prone to do, it's pretty much the bulk of the turnovers for the entire team. Because the rest of the roster doesn't really turn the ball over like that. Except for AD when he's getting turned into double teams and stuff like that turnovers do ensue in those situations but other than that it's usually Braun coughing the ball up ad coughing the ball up where he does and then when russell was here he coughed it up too other than that guy like austin reeves gonna give you two or three turnovers Schroeder probably turn the ball over two or three times everybody else gonna turn the ball over once at the most i mean we really don't have guys that handle the ball very much to turn the ball over as much or pass the ball as much to turn the ball over as much so it ain't gonna happen but memphis is gonna force steal so that's why it's so important in this series particularly if Braun. Uh, our number one turnover guy is intent on keeping that ball in his hands and making sure he makes easy plays for himself and others so that the turnovers can decrease for us and thus our chances of winning this series increase dramatically. Uh, so, yeah, that's what I'm looking at. Also, uh, continue to read the, win the rebounding total. We've definitely uh, got them in the rebounding total in the last game, and we have that advantage on them, so we should be able to continue that. And, uh, you know, shooting very well. You know, I don't expect the shots to fall like it did in the last game. We shot above 50% from the field, above 40% from the from the uh, three. I don't think that that's something we can really uh, rely upon. Uh, so we're going to have to continue to shore up other aspects of our game to assure that we can sustain lesser shooting percentages on a, any given night. Uh, so, yeah, man, that's what I'm looking at, you know, uh, shooting the free throw. We definitely don't want to revert back to bad free throw shooting. For the last two games, play-in tournament and the first playoff game, we've shot the free throw very well. As to which, throughout the course of the season, we've actually been a subpar of bad free throw shooting team. So I want to see us continue to be intent on hitting those free throws. Our team is doing a great job of that. And uh, I, I think it contributed a great deal to why we won these two games. Uh, so, that's that's what's on my mind, man. Them turnovers. Like I told you guys in the previous video about this team. We turn the ball over way more than the Memphis Grizzlies do when we play the Memphis Grizzlies versus when they play us. They just, they just, they've been effective in taking care of the ball better than we have, uh, in a in somewhat of a dramatic fashion. When you consider that second game, where we turned the ball over 26 times to their seven, it's just a little, it's a little ridiculous when you consider the the, the, the turnover uh, different um, dispar disparity. I don't know the word, but the differences in turnover. So disparity, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's really what it is, man. I just want us to sure up the basketball as a whole. And it starts with the King and AD, our stars, who are prone to do this more than anybody else on our squad. So that's what it is. Same guys who give us the most of what it is we do have to make sure not to take away from us just the same. And if they sure up what it is they're supposed to do, they're going to mask a lot of problems that would otherwise be there for us if for some reason guys don't play well. Uh, so... That's where my head is, man. Austin Reeves, I'm happy that he's healthy. I think he's one of those guys that's been able to benefit from that rest over the last three weeks because he had gotten a little banged up near the end of the season. Him and Schroeder, a few of our other guys, uh, uh, Vando, they have all been kind of dealing with stuff, playing through it. I think this is one of those situations where this rest has been tremendous for them. So I expect those guys to come out just as fresh as they did in the first game based on that rest. Um you know, so that's that's really where I'm at, man. That's, that's where my head is. Super excited about game two uh, here 
uh, in, well, there in Memphis, 4.30 is the time that game starts. It is 4 o'clock right now. So we got 30 minutes, so that's good enough. I'm going to leave this video right here. And, uh, yeah, go Lakers. Thank you guys for watching BDL44. I'm out.